Uh, my name is Jeffrey Brace. I am the vice president of the Vintage Computer Federation. This is a Vintage, the Vintage Computer Federation's YouTube channel. Um, I'm also showrunner for VCF East. Uh, today's talk is with Jim Hall. Jim Hall uh, is an open source software developer and advocate. He has authored and contributed to or maintained dozens of open source projects, but folks here may recognize him from FreeDOS, an open source implementation of the DOS operating system. He earned his Master of Science from the University of Minnesota and also teaches university courses on technical writing and on the history of technology, uh, which we'll learn today. So today's talk is Linux like Unix. Um, so take it away, Jim. All right, so thank you very much. And so uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and we can talk about uh, Linux like original uh, Unix. And so a uh, little bit of background here, uh, as you heard, so my, my name is Jim Hall and I uh, have a, a very definite interest in, uh, in retro technology and kind of how technology got from, uh, he, from there to here. Uh, and as part of that, I'd like to explore sort of the history of different parts of technology, including the history of Unix, which I just find uh, very fascinating. Uh, so kind of a brief background here on the history of the development of Unix. And so uh, you know, the first version on the PDP-11 uh, was 1971. So that was uh, obviously a little over 50 years ago. If you don't know the story about actually how Unix started, let me just take a, uh, like 30 seconds here and kind of tell the story is that uh, Ken Thompson uh, was working on some experiments with a, a disk drive and trying try to optimize throughput. And after he'd done a certain amount of work on that at Bell Labs, uh, he realized he was probably like three weeks away from having a full operating system. And he figured that he had like three things he needed to write, like an editor uh, and, and, and an assembler and, and a, a kernel. And, you know, each one of those would probably take about a week for him to do. Around that same time, his wife uh, was uh, going to go and visit all the relatives because they just had a, a, a baby. And so she was going to show the baby off to the, to the relatives. And he figured he had three full weeks uh, of uninterrupted time. And so he was able to create uh, the first prototype version uh, of Unix. And that grew to uh, the Unix that they had at Bell Labs. And uh, they got on the PDP-11 uh, because they really were trying to negotiate, uh, you know, getting a new system. I'll, I'll talk about that when we, when we show a picture of the PDP-11. But the first version was on running on the PDP-11. Uh, Unix second edition uh, came out in 1972 in June, uh, and that was the first version that really supported a C compiler because that's that's how old C is. C goes back to 1972. Uh, and in 1973, uh, that was the first version of Unix that supported pipes. And so you think about it this way, trying to run commands from one command to the other, right? It's a pretty basic function that we think of today. But yeah, it uh, until then, what you had to do if you wanted to run the output of one command through another command is you had to uh, uh, save the output of one command into a file and then you had to uh, read that file into the next program. And so it was, it was kind of convoluted if you want to get multiple programs to talk to each other. And so they had this concept called pipes where they could directly connect the output of one command into the input of the next command. And uh, kind of like connecting, uh, the description was kind of like connecting uh, segments of, of, a, of a garden hose together. And, and so that's where pipes uh, came from. 1973 in November is when the first public view of Unix came from. And it added a couple of extra commands. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm going to show the version off that was basically third edition. But, you know, you think about when we look at the, the commands here in a second, you'll see there's not much difference between uh, at least the commands I'm going to run between uh, the, the third edition and the fourth edition. Fifth edition was the version that was really available to higher education. That was really when it started to get out. Not saying that it wasn't available before then, but that's really when the uh, uh, it was made available to higher education. Uh, sixth edition was when you started to see commercial licenses. That was in 1975. Uh, and then looking ahead, so it actually took a couple years after that to get to Unix seventh edition. And so that was when uh, uh, the big addition there was really the born, the addition of the born shell. Uh, and so it started to get more sophisticated at the command line. Uh, eighth edition, you know, a couple years later. So it took a little while here to, uh, to get the next version, uh, 1985. And that was 
really only available for uh, education. If you wanted to uh, learn about the system, that's really the only uh, release there. So Bell Labs was not able to market this uh, because uh, there are various legal reasons I want to go into here, but they're basically they couldn't uh, sell this as a an operating system vendor, and so uh, you know this was something that was only available uh, to education. Uh, Unix ninth edition the next year, uh, that was really sort of a conceptual version of Unix, and so it really wasn't widely distributed. Uh, the last version of Research Unix was available in 1989, and that's really when, uh, at least in terms of my perspective, when I started to get into computing, that's actually when I started to get into uh, Unix systems. It was actually about a year later in 1990 uh, when I was an undergraduate in uh, in, in university. And, uh, and so I started to explore uh, Unix uh, on, for example, uh, Sun OS systems, on a Sun Microsystems, uh, Sun 350 workstation, uh, and then from there, kind of some other other systems. And so I, 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 that's sort of around my experience. It was around that 10th edition of, uh, of Unix. Kind of taking a deeper dive though into what these early versions of Unix looked like. This is the command list that you had. I mean, there are some other things as well, but this is really the section one command, right? The user-based commands uh, in first edition. Again, 1971. Uh, so you got a number of commands in here. You know, that's how you're seeing some familiar commands in there, hopefully. Uh, you know, cal throw on the calendar, cat to display a file, right? Concatenate the output of a file, uh, chadr to change to a different directory, uh, chmod to change the mode of a file, uh, cp to copy files, uh, df to show disk free, uh, disk usage for du, ed, ed's a pretty important command. Uh, and so ed was the editor at the time, right? And so if you're going to be editing files on Unix, this is long before <laughs> VI. Uh, you're not going to be running VI or Emacs. That whole VI Emacs war was well into the future. Uh, and so if you wanted to edit files, you're actually editing things using the ed editor, which is what we're going to be doing uh, today. There's some other commands in there that I'll kind of let you look at that list on your own. But I also want to highlight the Roth program. And so if you don't know what the Roth program is, uh, there was a, an older program called Runoff by Jerry Saltzer. Uh, it ran on the MITS system, I think it was. And uh, that that was a uh, text processing program, really a document preparation system. And I actually have interviewed Jerry about that. And, and he admits this is not the first document processing system, uh, but it was the one that, that he wrote because it's the one that he needed uh, to prepare his, uh, his thesis. Uh, 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 and so he uh, really added the features that he needed uh, to do uh, document preparation. That program was called Runoff. Uh, and so that name comes from the concept of I'm going to run off a document, right? That was sort of the term of the time. You're going to type up a document, you're going to copy a document, you're going to run off a document. And so he called it Runoff to run off a document. Uh, and it used uh, these commands uh, that would start on their own line that were starting with a dot. And that would allow you to do certain things like, you know, set the page margins and things like that, uh, double space, and uh, and and uh, and that was kind of a cool way to uh, create documents. And this, remember, at a time when computers had kilobytes of memory, so we're not talking about a lot of uh, a lot of memory here. And so we're not talking about fonts and things like that. Everything was being output. It actually runoff was generating output for what's called a chain printer, which is basically. You can imagine that as sort of a typewriter-like uh, device for output. Uh, the folks at Bell Labs thought that was a cool program, and so they wrote a version that used abbreviated commands because runoff could have very, very long commands. It could also have some short ones, but uh, it would have these very long commands that always start with a dot. And so they made a, an abbreviated version of that, that used abbreviated commands, and so they abbreviated the name, and now the name was called Roth. And so Roth really is short for runoff. Uh, and then uh, other things in there, Fortran uh, compiler, basic environment, you wanted to program in basic. Uh, and in the Unix uh, second edition, they, uh, they, that's when they wanted to uh, upgrade the system, right? So they wanted, uh, actually first edition was really when they upgraded the system. And so when they, when they wanted to buy a new system, previous that they're running on a, I think it was a PDP-7, and uh, they wanted to buy a newer computer that was faster, a little more memory. Uh, so they wanted to buy a PDP-11. And they went to management and made the request, can we buy a new computer? And management 
was kind of burned by having been involved in this other failed experiment uh, called Multix, which was a cooperation between uh, various organizations. And they said, no, uh, no money to buy a server to, to keep doing operating system stuff because you know we're, we're just not an operating systems company. Well, around that same time, the legal department at Bell Labs wanted to buy a new system that they could use to create documentation, actually patent application. And patent applications required, you know, kind of particular formatting. The system they were looking at buying didn't actually support, uh, the, it didn't have a text processing system that was finished for it, at least not something they could use. And so uh, the operating system guys, the Unix team, um, went to them and said, hey, tell you what, if you buy us a new computer, right, buy us a PDP-11, we'll put Unix on it, and we'll update the ROF program to support the formatting that you need to do patent applications. And they said, okay, great, we'll do that. And so that's what they did. And so they created a new version of ROF called NROF. And so NROF as a name actually stands for new ROF. Uh, now, uh, Unix seconded, and so that version showed up in, uh, in Unix second edition, that was it, where NROF showed up. Uh, but you'll also see a reference to ROF in the manual as well in the second. Uh, this, this is the first version, as I said, that had a C compiler. So C was very early at this time. Uh, and it looks a little different than what we do today, or at least uh, some of the syntax will be a little bit different. Uh, but this was the earliest uh, C compiler that we had on a Unix system. Also invented at Bell Labs, of course, by Dennis Ritchie. Uh, and uh, uh, Brian Kernahan had, uh, assisted in uh, documenting that. This is actually what the manual looks like for Unix second edition. I'm not going to show you the entire manual, but this is the manual that came out June 12, 1972. And of course, that's how we have the date. Uh, this was entirely printed on a uh, teletype. I think it was a teletype 37. Uh, so you basically think of that as a, uh, if you haven't don't know what a teletype 37 is, I got a photo in a little bit, but basically it's a, it's a typewriter like device. And so you're thinking about everything as being a single, uh, space for any kind of character, right? So a lowercase L is the same width as a capital M. Uh, and so that's where your, uh, the first uh, manual came from. And so just looking at the, the first two pages of the table of contents, so we can see the, uh, the, the section one commands. And so again, you can see that this one has uh, the, uh, uh, this one actually has the NROF command in it. Uh, it also has uh, another command that I wanna hide. So NROF, you can see that on the lower left-hand side on, uh, on page six, uh, there on the left-hand side, and that's, that's the NROF command. You can also see a reference to ROF up there on the top uh, of page seven. And uh, you can also see, I want to point out on the, towards the end of the list in section one, there's a command called type. Now in modern Unix systems, modern Linux more specifically, the bash shell has a built-in command called type. And that'll tell you if you do type, like for example, ls, it'll tell you if that's an alias or if that's an actual command that would run, if you were to run that program. Uh, back in this version of Unix, type was actually a command that would simulate typing a document because a teletype uh, printed on a long roll of paper, I'll show you a picture in a second, but it'll print on a long roll of paper and the type command would actually print out one page at a time and then wait for the user to press a key or actually hit enter before it does the, uh, the next page. And so that uh, was a command that you were gonna use if you needed to print uh, nice looking documentation uh, on, on letter sized paper. Now, third edition, uh, as I mentioned, this is the first one that had pipes. And this also, of course, added the debugger. This is also where they split out bin from user bin. I won't go into the sort of history about that. But again, kind of looking at the, at the manual, right, the commands that we have available to us in uh, Unix third edition, you know, we've added a couple of commands in here, right? So again, point out that on the left-hand side, you can see the NROF command uh, and uh, towards the bottom on the left-hand side. You can also, of course, see the ed text editor. Uh, there is no VI in here, right? There's no there's no VI system on this. Uh, the only editor is ed. And of course, we have uh, NROF to, uh, as I just mentioned, to, to print uh, documents and type uh, to, uh, to print things out. And, you know, this is what that PDP 11 uh, looked like. And so if, uh, if you're not 
uh, quite clear. If you haven't seen this photo before, uh, this is Ken Thompson, who's seated at the teletype. That's a Model 33. Uh, and uh, that is uh, Dennis Ritchie, who's standing next to him. And so uh, behind him is uh, those uh, circular discs are uh, tapes. And uh, uh, other parts of that cabinet are the actual uh, parts of the computer system itself. And so you can see that teletype. That's what I really wanted to talk about here. The teletype is it's sitting on a stand. It's mounted on a metal stand. And it's got a roll of paper that comes in from the back. And uh, that rolls under a uh, basically a print head. And uh, then it continues up and ejects out of the top of the uh, of the teletype. Now that's an entirely continuous uh, roll of paper. Now uh, Ken Thompson uh, has commented before that the uh, the teletype required a pretty significant finger press to uh, to actually activate a key press, and so uh, the, that's why the original version of Unix, these all these original Unix commands tend to have like two character uh, command names like CP and LS because he didn't want to do a lot of typing when it required pushing kind of hard on uh, on each one of those keys now uh the actual teletype this is a a, a better zoom of a teletype uh, that i picked up at a museum or i, I took a picture of at a museum uh and so you can see the keyboard there uh now the, the main uh uh detraction on the teletype 33 which is what this is uh, is that it can only print in uppercase uh but you're seeing some things in here that uh that are pretty significant you can see that roll that red roll uh, or, or that dowel, that's, that's where you would attach the, uh, or mount the, uh, the paper that would roll into the back of this uh, teletype. Uh, and you can see the knob on the left-hand side to advance the roller and, you know, being able to type in the commands. Now that uh, that that blank space on the right-hand side is uh, where you could ha um, mount an optional uh, modem. And so there are three different models of the 33 uh, teletype. The, uh, I think this is the 3310, if I recall correctly, uh, which means it doesn't have a modem and it doesn't have a paper tape unit. And so you could get another model that had a paper tape that was mounted on the left-hand side. And when I was an undergraduate student, uh, we actually had a, a, a teletype uh, 33 uh, that we could use to print out Fortran programs. And the fact that it could only print uppercase wasn't really an issue for us because Fortran's always uppercase anyway. Uh, and uh, so there was a teletype that was mounted on the left, and actually that's what that you, you can see that on the teletype that uh, is next to uh, Ken there on the uh, PDP-11, that, that system on the left is where the, the paper tape gets mounted. On the right-hand side, that blank spot, as I said, that's where a modem would get added into the system if you wanted to add a modem to that. That was the third model that could do a modem. This is what the Model 37 teletype looked like, and it could do uppercase and lowercase. Uh, also had sort of a little plastic housing to put in the uh, uh, the, uh, the the paper, so that way it wasn't quite as noisy. Uh, now you could roll in a, uh, an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper, and uh, you know basically eject the the continuous roll and put in an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper, and that would allow you to print on a U.S. letter. Uh, piece of paper. Now, uh, this would print at 10 characters per inch uh, going uh, left and right, and it would be six lines per inch going up and down. So on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, you've actually got 85 columns possible on that sheet of paper and 66 lines. Now, the problem was the teletype actually couldn't do uh, 85 columns wide. It could only print, uh, if I recall correctly, about 67 columns. If that's not the right number, it's pretty close. Uh, and so it can only print like it's 67, 68 columns. Uh, and so you can imagine that piece of paper being centered in that uh, output of 67 columns out of a possible 85. Uh, and, uh, you know, around 1969, you started to see video terminals come up. And this is a, a VT-52, which actually came out, uh, I think, in 1974. Uh, and so it's actually a little late for what we're talking about here for 50 years ago. But, you know, since 1969 is when we started to have, uh, you know, video terminals around. And so that's what we're going to kind of simulate today is we're going to pretend uh, to run on a uh, on a video terminal uh, from around uh, 50 years ago, 1973. Uh, and so we'll simulate that. I'm going to exit out of the presentation and we can simulate that uh, by using cool retro term. And so cool retro term is uh, sort of simulating different effects you can get on a, a video terminal. And so it's highly pixelated by, uh, in, by design uh, to kind of simulate that old uh, display. Now here, this is set up to be uh, 80 columns wide and 24 columns tall. 
Uh, and that's because uh, it's really the font, <laughs> really, as, as I chose. But uh, terminals would actually be 80 columns wide. And they would actually, the screen could display 25 lines, but the bottom line is usually reserved for uh, the terminal itself to display status information. So you really got 24 lines uh, being displayed back to the user. And so if you ever wonder when you bring up a terminal window in Linux, why it only has 24 lines? Well, that's because it comes back to this. Uh, and so uh, having a terminal here that's 80 columns wide by 24 columns tall, actually doing a pretty good job of simulating what it looked like to be on an original uh, Unix system. Now I want to kind of play around and kind of show what it looked like to do real work on a Unix system from 50 years ago. And so here I've got, it's just set up as a dumb terminal. Uh, it, it doesn't do anything like, like VI. I don't have anything in my current uh, directory. Uh, and so let's go ahead and edit a file. Now, again, uh, there is no way to clear the screen here, right? This is basically emulating a, uh, a, a teletype device, but only through a video screen. So you're never going to clear the screen in what we're going to see here. Uh, and so let's go ahead and edit a new file. Now, one thing you would do to uh, edit a document or create a document uh, for print uh, on Unix 50 years ago was you would use the NROF uh, typesetting system, document preparation system. And so let me do a simple document that, that's, that does that. And so we'll use the add editor. And I'm going to edit a new file. Now, uh, you don't actually have to use file extensions. Back then, file extensions, pretty meaningless. Uh, and so these days, if you're going to write a, an NROF document, or actually GROF is the implementation on, on Linux systems today, uh, you could use an extension. And a lot of people who write GROF documents actually use an extension to indicate what macro package they're using. But here we don't have to. We don't actually have to do that. And so we'll do add on a new uh, file that we'll just call unimaginatively uh, file. And there is no file in there, right? Because I did an ls and it was an empty directory. And so it's just telling us that there is no such file or directory. And it looks like we've hit an error and maybe the system is hung because we're getting no other output on here. But actually, this is what you'd expect, right? There is nothing there. And it, Ed is now waiting for us to do something. And uh, it, it doesn't display a prompt by default. The original ed did not display a prompt. Now, on Unix systems today or, or Linux systems today using GNU ed, you can actually do a capital P, and that will uh, generate a star for a prompt. But I'm actually going to go really old school. I'm not even going to display any kind of a prompt. We're just going to do it sort of typing commands. I guess I'll describe it into the air. Uh, and so let's insert some new files. We're actually, uh, because there's no file here, we're in a new file. And so anything that we insert is going to be right away at the beginning of the file. And so let's go ahead and insert some new text using the I command. And so I'll just hit return on that. And so now I'm in insert mode. And so uh, Ed is a mode-based editor. And so you think about you know VI and you read about these different modes that it has, edit mode, command mode. It actually got that from Ed. It was a pretty big deal when you had editors later on, uh, like Emacs and other ones, that were modeless, right? There was no exiting out of edit mode uh, to run a command. You could uh, you could, you could could ex execute a command, but you're right back into uh, edit mode. And so you could execute a command by, for example, an Emacs with the escape key, and you could meta X uh, to run some command like that. Uh, in a modern system using a GUI, you're probably using a menu uh, to activate a command or something. but uh, here in Ed, it's mode-based, and so we were in command mode, and now we've done I. Now we're in edit mode. We're actually inserting some text. And so uh, we could write uh, documents in, uh, in NROF. Uh, I'm going to do it without uh, any kind of macros, and we'll add that in in a little bit. And so we're going to just add some vertical space on my document. So we'll space down. Uh, let's space down by two inches. And so if you remember that there's six inches per line, uh, then two inches would be 12 lines. And so we're going to add 12 blank lines of space. And I want to uh, center some output. Maybe I want to create a, uh, a title page here. And so we're going to do, uh, or at least the title of a document. And so I'm going to center using .ce. That will center uh, the next line if I just have .ce. Or I'm going to actually center, in this case, the next two lines of output. And uh, the first one's going to be, uh, first line will be Linux, uh, like uh, 50 years ago. And then I'm going to add 
an extra blank line of space. That doesn't actually count towards the dot CE. Dot CE being two in this case is going to center the next two output lines. Uh, and a blank line with a dot SP doesn't actually count. And so now I'm going to do another line that will also be centered. We'll just put in my name, Jim Hall. Now I'm going to uh, stop inserting there. I'm going to do a period. And that tells uh, the Ed that we're actually done doing an insert. Because I just realized, of course, that Linux, like 50 years ago, is not uh, in, uh, let's, let's put it in all uppercase. Uh, and so what line is that? And so we can actually need to run a command to tell it uh, what line we're going to edit. Uh, and so we can figure out what lines we have by asking it to print out all the lines with a number in front. And so we'll do one, comma, and then dollar sign. That says start at line one and go until the end of the file. Dollar sign means the last line of the file. And then we're going to do an N command, and that will put uh, a number in front of each line. And so there it is. I've got uh, numbers in front of each line. Uh, and so I want to edit line three. And so I can actually just remind myself what line three looks like by doing a three that says it's going to execute something on line three. I'm going to just print it out without any kind of uh, you know tabs or numbers or things like that. Just remind myself what the indentation level is like. And so let's go ahead and, and change line three. So we're going to do a three to indicate that we're going to change line three and C will actually change that line. And so I hit return, and then I'm going to do it in all uppercase uh, Linux like 50 years ago. And uh, I'm done editing that. And so now I'm going to do period to get out of the change mode, right? Because if I kept adding more lines, it's going to keep inserting more text. But I only wanted to change that one line. So there it is. I've just edited line three. Now, how do I verify that actually that looks right? Well, I can do one comma dollar to print out all of the lines of my file, although actually you could use percent. Percent is actually shorthand uh, for, the, uh, for, for the entire range of the file. So percent will, is the same as doing one comma dollar, and we'll print out the contents of my file. And so this is uh, one, two, three, four, five lines that are in my file. And so I've now made a, uh, a capital I, all caps, uh, uh, title of my document. And so uh, after line five, I'm going to append some information to this. And so we're going to append some lines. And then I can just uh, type in uh, a document. And so I might, uh, for example, do a temporary indent of, let's say, four spaces. And so four spaces, uh, or sorry, five, five spaces, four spaces. Uh, and that will now create a temporary indent. And so I'll just describe a little bit uh, what it's like to use NROF. And so I'll say, uh, uh, this is the uh, NROF uh, document preparation system. And then I'll, I, I tend, when I write, uh, when I write documents in NROF or, or, or TROF, TROF is a more recent version, I tend to uh, start new sentences on a new line. Uh, it doesn't matter because NROF is actually going to collect these words and fill a paragraph. In fact, I'll describe that here. I'll say uh, uh, NROF will uh, collect words. Actually, let's let's underline that. I can actually say dot UL. Actually, we'll underline that word. We'll collect uh, 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 words, and uh, and it will and it will. Uh, uh, fill, we'll underline that, dot UL, will fill paragraphs. And so collecting words means it's going to read uh, words one at a time from the input, and it's going to fill the paragraph. It's going to try and uh, put that as on as wide as we uh, can. Now, uh, NROF, uh, uh, this only, uh, uh, this version, uh, uh, and that's the NROF uh, program, uh, expects to print to a typewriter-like device. Uh, which means every character has the same width. And the original, as I said, uh, teletype uh, model 37 uh, normally printed uh, at about, I think it was 67 columns, uh, but you could uh, load uh, U.S. letter paper, single sheet, uh, which was actually uh, an imaginary 
uh, 85 columns. And that's because uh, it was printing at uh, 10 characters per inch and six lines uh, per inch. Okay, and so I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time writing my document, but as you can see, this is now uh, a, a simple document. So I'm going to do period to get out of my uh, insert mode. And so now I've been uh, adding some uh, uh, some text to my document. Uh, if I were to want to kind of review where I am, well, I can kind of look at uh, the whole file by doing percent and then P. That'll print out the entire document. And so you can see that uh, this, the third line on the screen is actually the percent %p that I just type as the command. And you can see the rest of my output there is uh, is showing, uh, you know, the S, dot .sp, which is going to uh, space down 12 lines. Dot .ce2 will center the next two lines. Uh, there's a, a ti, which will do a temporary indent. I've got ti4, that will do a temporary indent. And you can see some uh, lines are being underlined. And so this is how you would write documents on Unix uh, 50 years ago. And so if I were to just write this back to disk, and so I'm just gonna uh, write this back to disk here, and let's go ahead and, and quit the editor. So it's written 467 bytes back to the system. I'm gonna quit back to the operating system, and now there I am back at my uh, Unix shell. And I'm gonna just do an LS so we can see that my file exists. Now, if I wanted to print this out, uh, I would just run nroth with the file. Now, that's going to generate one page at a time. It's going to print out uh, 66 lines. And so anything that's blank, uh, it will basically print out some blank lines to kind of fill out the rest of the 66 lines. So when I when I run this command, we'll actually see kind of a blank screen. I don't think we'll have any uh, any lines at the top. Yeah, and so there we go. It looks like it looks like we've cleared our screen, but actually because our content is sitting way above. Now let's imagine what it's like to print on a teletype. And so let me skip over to a, uh, I've got a teletype window that I've got here. And so this is a GNOME uh, terminal. And I've got this set up to be uh, 80 columns wide and 67 uh, lines tall. And, uh, you know, as I said, the uh, 80 columns is pretty common for a uh, uh, for a terminal today. But as I said, teletypes were actually uh, about 67 lines wide, and so I'm going to do 67. And so now I've got 67 lines wide, or columns wide, and 67 lines tall. Now, why do I have 67 lines tall? It's because when I uh, run this command. Uh, when I when I print out uh, the contents of a, of a single file, uh, this way we can see 66 lines, and then my, my my prompt will be at the bottom. So we actually won't roll off the top line. Uh, how do I know that? Well, if I were to go back to my regular uh, shell over here and just actually run uh, nrof on my file, and we'll send it to some output file. We'll call it out. Uh, now, if I bring up my terminal window again, if I were to uh, let's say edit that file, so I want to be able to I would generate some. I want to generate some uh, line numbers in front of that. Well, if you go back and look at the slides, we we don't have awk. <laughs> awk doesn't exist, uh, not yet, and so we can't actually run a command that will uh, put line numbers in front. And I know that some of you are like, well, just run the dash n option on cat. Well, that, that didn't that option didn't exist yet either. <laughs> uh, so Unix was uh, the intention was every command would focus on doing one thing very well, and it would send its output to another program, which would then further modify it. And so I don't actually have a command in 50 years ago that's going to show me uh, line numbers in front of my uh, my file. Except I actually do. We just did that with Ed. And so I know that this is kind of small. You may not be able to see the output here very well, but that's that's actually OK. Uh, the, the, the point here is that we just want to see uh, the lines on here and see that it starts at 1, which I think you'll be able to see, and then um, uh, I have a, a, a prompt at the very bottom of the screen. So here you can just did an ls, and you can see file, and then out, and out was my output. And so let's run the output uh, into the ed command. So we're going to run ed on the file out. And so it's read 592 bytes. And remember, I want to print all the lines with a number in front. Remember how we did that? We did that with percent and then n. And so this is sort of the cheap way just to demonstrate 
from 50 years ago Unix uh, that this file really does have uh, 66 lines in it. And so here we've got 66 lines. And actually, somehow my terminal has less than, uh, actually, there we go, it's 67. And so, oh, it's because my output is uh, is too wide. And so my output is actually really wide there. Um, and uh, so I can fix that in a second. But yeah, as you can see, the important thing is at the bottom here, I've got 66, uh, and then the next line is my uh, shell. Uh, let me go ahead and do Q to get out of the uh, editor. Uh, and so let's let's go ahead and fix this issue where I have uh, you know my output is kind of wide, and it's it's wide because uh, the current version of NROF just has assumptions that you're going to be printing something a little bit wider, and so you would actually create uh, a, a a document 50 years ago that would actually control output. And so we're going to edit a new file. We're going to add on a new file. It's going to control the page layout. So it's called page. That file doesn't exist. Let's go ahead and insert some lines. And so here we want to set the line length. Now, the uh, uh, if uh, if I'm if my my teletype can only print out uh, 67 lines, well, I definitely want to have uh, my line length being less than 67. I also want to imagine and remember that my uh, uh, my eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper can actually actually has 80. Uh, if I would imagine 10 characters per inch, it has basically 85 columns in theory on it. Uh, it's not printing all 85 columns, but we can imagine there's 85 columns to display on a piece of paper. Uh, and so, uh, you know, 85 minus uh, 67 is is getting kind of close to uh, 10. So I'm just going to do uh, sort of five characters as an offset there. And so I want to do, uh, let's do a line length. I think I can do a, get away with this if I say a line length. Dot LL is going to set the line length. Uh, and I think if I set this to, I'm trying to do some math in my head. Uh, and I think if I were to set this to uh, 60 characters wide on a line, and then I also want to insert a little bit uh, of page offset on the left-hand side to kind of make an imaginary margin. Uh, and so I can do a dot PO, and that's a page offset. And so this is how uh, documents were written 50 years ago. And yes, we do a page offset. Let's do like, it doesn't need to be very many because we've got uh, some characters kind of lost on the left-hand side because they're we're centering our, our, uh, our piece of paper on these 67 output, uh, 67 columns of output. And so we'll just go like four, columns uh, on the left-hand side. I don't need to do anything else than that. I can just do a uh, period to edit that, to end my insert. And we'll go ahead and write my file and quit back to the operating system. And if I were to now run that using uh, NROF on uh, page, now define my page setup, and then my file, and send that to out. And so now I'm overwriting my output file. And I were to go back to my terminal window, let's add, let's do run that through add as well. So we'll run add on the output file, and let's go ahead and print all lines with a number in front of it. Uh, and the number is getting in the way, so let's go ahead and just do print all lines uh, on the file. And so there it is. I've got a document that I've now printed uh, through uh, NROF that I could. Uh, display on my system. And so uh, now, now, what does this look like when you have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper? So this is 67 wides, uh, 67 columns uh, wide. And so let's actually add another terminal to this. And so this is another terminal that I have. Uh, it's uh, set up as, again, 80 columns wide, but uh, and 67 columns tall. Let's go ahead and make that 85 columns wide, 67 columns tall, or 67 lines tall. And so this should be roughly the size of a piece of paper. Uh, and if I were to, uh, actually, we'll just make it one row shorter. Now, this 85 by 66 should be the size of a piece of US uh, letter paper. And so I'm just going to move that on top. I'll just move my uh, other window, so it's more or less centered. And this is about how you do it by printing a piece of paper on a, uh, printing a document on a piece of paper. So you can imagine that uh, this terminal window I've just now laid on top of the wider terminal window. This is the output uh, from a teletype model 37, and the white uh, terminal behind it is representing a US letter piece of paper.
And so as I print out my document, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a margin over there. And I've tried to balance this document so that I've got a line length set up and uh, a page offset. So the length of my line and then a page offset on the left-hand side so I can kind of center my, uh, my page, my, my, my document inside uh, my eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It looks like I probably could have uh, maybe subtracted something from the, uh, from the layout there on the, on the right-hand side, but we'll leave it as it is. And so this is how you would write documents. Now you actually wouldn't spend a lot of time uh, writing your own, you know, macros to set up the page, for example, uh, you actually would create a bunch of macros to kind of stack up uh, these commands to do different things. And so as you were to write a technical document, you probably want to, uh, you know, do things like uh, temporary indent by default. You want to be able to, uh, you know, create section headings. You want to be able to italicize uh, 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 output and things like that. Oh, by the way, uh, let me demonstrate uh, since we actually had some underlining in there. Uh, so there's my eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Uh, and you can notice, by the way, I just want to highlight that you can actually see uh, this is an underlined word and this is an underlined word. I didn't really highlight that earlier, but that's, that's, that's the output that you're seeing. And of course it's filled out the paragraph. So it's completely uh, filled out, even though my input lines didn't go all the way across the page. By the way, I'm, I'm going to add right there. I'm going to go ahead and quit it so I can get out of it. All right, so I, as I said, you wouldn't actually normally spend uh, a lot of time, you know, typing these NROF commands by hand. You actually would stack up a bunch of uh, commands together to find some macros. And you can do it on your own, for example, if I were to uh, edit a new file uh, called paragraph, and so it's called para, and I could, uh, that's a new file, and we'll insert some lines here, and we'll define a new macro called EP. So this is what you do to add a new paragraph. PP is a typical uh, abbreviation for new paragraph. I just added some extra character there. And so you could, for example, add a new blank line uh, with .sp, add one line of space. Uh, you could do a temporary indent of four spaces, and then we're done, right? We're done with our macro, and so dot dot is the end of a macro definition. Uh, but we're still in the insert mode, so we can go ahead and exit out of the insert mode. And now we can write that back to the operating system and we can quit it. Now let's go ahead and edit our file to actually use the PP macro. And so let's go ahead and add my file and remind ourselves what's in there. So let's do a percent N. So we'll see what's, what's all in there. And I want to replace that TI4 that's on line six with dot PP. And so I'm going to uh, six C will allow me to change line six and we'll replace that with .pp. And let's go ahead and, and finish my change with period. Now I also want to, let's, let's say I wanted to uh, start a new paragraph where it says the original teletype model 37 normally printed at about 67 columns. And so uh, that by replacing that one line, I shouldn't have changed my lines, uh, my line numbers. And so it should be inserting a new line at, at line uh, 17. But just to remind ourselves what's in here, let's, let's start at line 15 and we'll end at line 18 and we'll print those lines out. And so, yep, definitely true that uh, uh, 15 is this version, line 16 is device, uh, line 17 is the original teletype, a new, new sentence, which I want to make a new paragraph, and then uh, line 18 is 67 columns. So I want to uh, either append to the end of line 16 to make a new line, or I want to insert ahead of line 17 to make a new line. Either one of those will do the job. And so I'm going to do a 16 append. And so I'm going to append uh, new lines after line 16. And we'll just insert uh, a .pp instruction. And I'm done adding new lines. So we'll do a period to stop editing. And then let's, let's see what that looks like. So we'll start at line 15 and go to the end of the file. We'll print out those lines. And sure enough, I've got a a uh, new paragraph macro in there. So I'm using my paragraph macro. And so the way that I would just do, uh, write that back to disk and uh, quit back to the operating system. And let's remind ourselves what that looks like when we now print it. And so go back to our, there's our eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And there is our 
uh, teletype output that's coming in. And so if I were to run nroth uh, on the page definition, as well as the paragraph macro that I just defined, and then the file itself, that now creates a new paragraph where it says the original teletype model 37. And so uh, you're starting to see how you would use these macros. You'd build up these macros to create more complex documents. And in fact, I chose .pp because it's very similar to another macro package uh, called uh, the ME macros uh, written by Eric Allman. Uh, and I think everything in here is OK. But let's go ahead and add my file one more time. And we'll print it out and just make sure that everything in here is OK. Everything is, uh, so I've got .ul, which I could keep that way. But actually, uh, uh, we, could, we could replace that uh, to be more accurate with the uh, .me macros. And so let's, let's see what lines that is for, uh, for UL. Now, it, the interesting thing is, I, and I've done this by uh, playing around with Ed long enough as sort of a running everything on the command line, uh, you're, you start to build up a kind of a mental model of where things live in your, uh, in your document. And so you kind of, I, I kind of, by doing that, I kind of know that I should probably start around line eight and go to probably around line 17, maybe line 20. Uh, but I'm going to start at line 8 and go to line 15. And then I'm going to uh, print out those uh, with an N. So that'll be a number in front. And so, yep, you can see that uh, 9 and 10 uh, are the ones that have the underlined with collect. Uh, and so let's, instead of doing underline, let's use a macro that the ME macros would use. Uh, which is dot i that'll do italicize if you're going to on a typesetter uh, but on a teletype device like this it's going to print out using uh, underline and so i actually want to change uh line uh nine uh, and i need to get rid of line 10 so let's let's get rid of line 10 so i'm going to do 10 d that'll get rid of line 10. so now 10 has been deleted and let's go ahead and replace line C. So I'm going to change, uh, I'm sorry, ch uh, change line 9. So there's 9C will allow me to change line 9, which is dot UL. So we'll do dot I and then the word collect. And I'm done editing. So there we go. That's our period. And let's look at that again. So we'll do uh, start at line 8, go to line 15, and we'll number those lines. Yep, and you can see that I got rid of my dot UL and replace it with UL or with I and then the word collect. And do the same thing for lines 11 and 12. So we're going to get rid of line 12. 12D, 12 we'll delete it. Let's change line 11. Uh, and uh, we'll do that. Oh, actually, you know what? Let's do this. Let's, let's, uh, uh, let's do one other uh, thing, way that we can edit uh, documents. We can actually use the swap command. And so you're probably used to this if you use sed on the command line, or maybe you use bi, and you probably are using this command all the time, the s command. And so now that I've deleted line 12, I actually want to operate on line 11. And on line 11, I want to swap uh, some characters. And so I want to swap the ul command for i and then the word fill. And so the way that the s command works in sed, or in ed, and it works the same way in, uh, in, in sed and vi, is it's going to swap text, starting at the first slash and going to the next slash. That's the text it's looking for. And then between that, that second slash and the third slash, that's the text it's going to replace it with. And if I had more than one instance on the line that I wanted to replace this ul with i fill, I could do g to make it global. But I don't need to do that. I'm just going to do uh, just one instance. And so now I've swapped line uh, 11 to change the ul to an i fill. So now it's got a dot i fill. So let's go and look at line 11. We'll just print it out. Yep, there it is, i fill. And so now if we're just, uh, just going to show you what the entire file looks like, we'll just print out the entire file. And so this is more like what you would expect to see in a... Um, uh, in, in a in a uh, NROF uh, document using the ME macros, and so let's write back to the uh, back to the operating system, and we'll quit. And now we can uh, go back to our eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper. That's our reminder there, and we're going to uh, now run the NROF command using the ME macros. I, st I still need to set up my page the same way, uh, but now I don't need to have my para file, which is my, my definition for the paragraphs, I can just now run the file itself. 
And so there it is. I've got a document that I was able to print out uh, using the ME macros. And so that is how you can write documents. Now, uh, how, what if I wanted to print this out? What if I had a multiple page document? Uh, for that, you would actually need to write, uh, we, you'd use the type command, the type command I mentioned earlier, which we actually don't have. As I said, the type command, and so here I'm actually in reality running a, a bash shell. And if I were to run the type command, uh, on let's say CP, it'll tell you that the, the CP command has actually been CP. But in the original Unix, type was a command that would uh, print out 66 lines and then wait for the user to press enter, and then it would uh, print the next 66 lines. And so that way, the, by by waiting for you to press enter, you could load a piece of eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper, and it would print out the 66 lines, and then it would wait for you to press enter while it. Uh, while it uh, while you could load another eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper, so I'm going to real quick here write a, a, a C program, an original syntax C program uh, that will replace the type command. And so for that, we're going to just remind ourselves what files we have in here. I don't actually have a type command, and so we're going to do an ed on a file called type.c. Now type.c doesn't exist, and uh, it's really just waiting for us to enter a command. It's not actually an error per se. And so I can start inserting some lines. And so I'm going to go ahead and insert and start typing a new, a new uh, program. Now, this is something that's interesting, and I would challenge you to do it on your own. Uh, run a full screen terminal for like a week and write documents using NROF and edit files using ed. You'll find that your, your brain kind of uh, starts to work a little bit differently than uh, than we do today with the GUI. Uh, and so it sort of becomes second nature. So I'm going to try and do this a little bit slower, but to me, it is kind of at this point second nature. Uh, but I'm inserting uh, lines here. I'm going to do my include standard io.h. And you know, to define a new function in modern C, you would say, well, I'm going to define a new function. It's an integer function uh, called pause. And that's a void function. It doesn't actually take any input. Uh, but that's not original style C. So let's let's actually back up a second. We'll stop editing. My current line is the last one I was just editing. So if I do P, you can see it's actually just the line that it was on. And so let's go ahead and, and change that line. So we're going to change that line to actually be original style C. And so original style C, 50 years ago, uh, every function was really integer if you didn't ask for some to be something else. And so we can just type pause. And then an empty uh, parameter list because there's, it doesn't take any options. Uh, and then we'll do our uh, open curly brace. By the way, you'll notice I'm still doing C from that last line. So actually, we're inserting new lines as we go. We changed that line, and now we're adding new lines to our file. And so here we're going to uh, read a key. And so we'll do int a uh, variable called key, and that's like meant to be the key press. And then I'm just going to do a loop. It's going to wait. It's going to read every key from standard input because that is the terminal, right? <laughs> 50 years ago, that's a terminal. Uh, and so it's going to read from standard in, and it's going to uh, just look for a, a new line character. And so it's going to do a while that key being uh, equal to the get uh, care function. And as long as that is not equal to a new line, then it's going to just do the while loop, right? Semicolon. I don't have to have a, there's nothing that does otherwise. I don't, I don't, I'm not processing anything. And then once it, it's done, it's going to just go ahead and return back to whoever called it. And we'll give it zero because I don't really care. All right. And so that is a, a function in the original style C. Uh, now, I, I actually need a, a function that's going to type out the contents of the file one line at a time, uh, and it'll do only 66 of them. Now, in modern programming, you actually would define a parameter uh, called page length or something, and you define that to be 66 because, you know, that's good programming. You parameterize that stuff. Uh, but we're doing this on a on a teletype model 37, and we know it's going to be 66 lines, six lines per inch, 11 uh, inches long, and so that's 66 uh, lines. And so we actually don't need to define a parameter here. We can just do the actual number. So here we go. We're going to define a function here called type file. 
And type file uh, takes uh, a file argument uh, that we're going to call in. Oh, wait a second. That's actually modern C style, right? So I know some people out there that are like, oh, no, 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 that's 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 modern C style. And it is. And so we're going to, and we're going to, we're going to remind ourselves here what we've entered in. So uh, I've done P to get our dot to get back to the edit mode. And we're going to go ahead and, and uh, print out the entire contents of our file and uh, remind ourselves what, li what line we're on right now. So let's do P for the current line, and that's the type file. So we'll go ahead and change that, and it'll make it look like original style C, and that is type file uh, on, uh, with a variable called in. And in is a file pointer, and that's what that looks like. And now I can start my function. And so if you haven't seen original style C before, that's, that's original style C. Uh, and so here we need to read uh, a, a single character at a time from our file. And so I need a, an int ch, which will be a single character that we're reading from our input file. Uh, this is not the most performant program, um, but, you know, because like you would probably today write this by reading buffers or something like that. But um, on an original style Unix system, we're, me we're measuring memory in kilobytes. And so we want to save as much memory as we can. If we don't need to, uh, you know, read everything uh, into, a, into a buffer, then why bother? We're going to just read one character at a time. And in any case, printing the output on the uh, on the teletype is actually going to be slower than reading data from a file. So it, it turns out performance isn't really an issue for reading files because the output's going to be slow anyway. Uh, so we're going to just uh, read one character at a time. Uh, and I need to have a variable in here called lines that will count the number of lines that I've read. And I'll just initialize that to be zero. And then I'm going to do a loop. I'm just going to do a loop here. So while uh, the character is read from, uh, actually, it's an f get c, uh, read from that input file. And as long as that isn't the end of the file, then we're going to keep doing our loop. And all right, so what do I do inside there? So once I've read the character, I can actually print it back out to the uh, to the output. And so in theory, if I'm typing this out on eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, this is just printing one character at a time. So I'll just do a put care uh, of ch. And I, I want this to go to standard output. I don't, I don't want this to go to uh, like parameterize this and have it go to possibly to a file or something. We're, we're, we know we're printing this to standard output. Let's just print right to standard output with the put care function. Uh, and then once we've done that, we, we should probably double check if that was a a new line. And so we're going to say uh, if that character was a new line character, then uh, we want to uh, add one to the to the line count and then check if our uh, our line count has now reached 66. And so we could do that a couple of different ways. We could say uh, lines uh, equals lines plus one. Uh, and then we could check uh, if lines is 66, then we're going to do something. But it's, it, that's actually not how C programmers write that. And so I'm going to do period there to get back into uh, into my command mode. By the way, let's save before we do anything else, because it's always good to save early, save often. Uh, and so where was I? I left off here. I'll just uh, number that. So that's, that's line 22. And so let's back up to line 18 uh, and go to the end of the file, and we'll we'll print those lines out. Uh, and so I want to replace those last two lines. And so let's go ahead and get rid of the last line. Uh, so if I count on screen, I can see put care is line 18, and the blank is line 19, uh, 20 is the if, uh, 21 is the lines equals, and 22 is the if. And so I'm going to go ahead and delete uh, line 22, and then we're going to swap out line 21. So 21C. And so the more efficient way to write that as a C programmer uh, is to uh, just say uh, if, uh, and then we'll increment lines first. If lines uh, is uh, lines equals uh, 66, then we're going to call the pause function, which will read from standard in until it uh, hits a, a, a return key. And then it will then reset the lines back to zero, and I think I'm keeping track of this, and I think that's my if over there, and then this one should be the other if that I had, 
and then reminding ourselves what we have. So I'm going to start at line 15 and go to the end of the file and just number them out. And so there we go. So I, my next one needs to be the while. And so let's do remind ourselves here, 25 print, just so I know where my invent level is. So we'll do 25 append. And then that should be the while loop right there. And then we can return back to the, whoever called us, return zero. And there's our function there. And so we're almost done. We're actually almost done with the type uh, command. And so now we can write our, our main function. So normally we do an int main with uh, argc, care argv. Uh, but uh, remember, original style c, it's going to look like this. We're going to say main, and then argc, and then argv. And it's going to be an int argument count and a character array of argv. And there's my main function. And we're going to uh, have a file pointer here, what's called pfile. And then we're going to uh, be able to parse the command line. We're going to read each command in the command or file on the command line. So we'll do an integer i to sort of loop through. And then we can do a loop that says for i equals one. That's the one after the, the command itself. Uh, and then i is less than argc, and then i plus plus. And then we're going to open that file. P file will be uh, using f open of argv. I. So if you haven't done C programming before, we just now opened a file from whatever is the ith entry, starting at one, uh, where one is the first command line option. Uh, and we're going to open that for reading. And then if we actually have a valid uh, file pointer, and I know there's people out there that do program in C and they're like, well, you're not comparing that to if it's not null. It's, this is this is fine. Original style C. This is totally acceptable. Uh, and then I'm going to, uh, if that is true, let's let's give the operator a moment to actually uh, now swap in a piece of paper. And so we'll call the pause function there. And then we will type out the file that is pointed to by p file. And then once I'm done with that, I probably should close my file. So we'll do an F close on p file. And once I've done that, that's all I need to do. I'm going to just silently ignore <laughs> any, uh, you know, let's do this. I'll, I'll silently ignore uh, any missing files or any files I can't open uh, because uh, that we're, we're typing this out to a, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And that's probably expensive. So we don't want to be printing out error messages. We'll just silently ignore that. And then there's my for loop. And then I can return back the operating system. And then there's my closing curly brace. And if I type everything in correctly, so now I'm out of edit insert mode, I'm going to now uh, write that back to the operating system. Let's remind ourselves what that file looks like. Print out every line in the file. That looks good to me. Uh, if I were to quit back out of here and actually just view the file, uh, so type that C, that looks good to me, right? More, uh, so more of my file here, and I can see that that all looks correct to me. And now that we've done that, we can now run the C compiler, CC, where the output to a program called type from type.c is my source file. And we're getting some errors because modern C doesn't like those styles. <laughs> it wants to have uh, 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 type on all of our functions, but original style C, it will default to int. So we're just getting a warning here that it's uh, that it uh, is going to default to an integer, and that's okay. And so now, if I were to uh, do nrof of my uh, using the me macros uh, with my page setup of my document called file and save that into out and go back to my eight and a half. And there's my terminal. And now as the operator, I'm going to type in, use the command type on my output file. And that is going to wait for me to hit enter. And so now I'm uh, ejecting my continuous roll piece of paper and now loading in an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And now I can hit enter and it prints out 66 lines on my eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And if I know that my document is only supposed to be uh, one page long, then now uh, while I'm waiting, while the system is waiting for me to press enter, I'm ejecting that eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper because it's already ejected anyway. I'm gonna reload my continuous sheet of paper and then I can hit return and now I get back to my shell prompt. And so 
it's really interesting, I find, to go back uh, in original uh, Unix and actually uh, uh, really explore what it's like uh, to run uh, to, to run your Unix or to run your Linux system like it's an original Unix system. I think if you were to experiment with this uh, and uh, and and run your 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 shell uh, at full screen with 80 columns wide and about 24, 25 col uh, lines tall. Uh, and and try that for a good week. I'll, I'll bet that your mind will kind of, uh, you know, sort of operate in a little bit different way. But more importantly, that will give you a real appreciation for what it was like to run Unix systems uh, from 50 years ago. Anyway, uh, cool. that's that's it for my presentation. I will uh, see if we have any questions. All right. Can you see and hear me now? <laughs> I can see and hear you. All right. Great. Um, we did have some questions, so. Um, first of all, which computer was used while developing Unix? The very first system was on a PDP-7, uh, and uh, that's what they used to develop uh, Unix System 1. Uh, the, after that, they were developing uh, uh, on a, uh, a PDP-11, and uh, so the prototype version was basically in PDP-7, and after that, it was running on a PDP-11. Uh, they did do an upgrade sometime after that, but I don't remember offhand what system they went to. Uh, but uh, yeah, the first versions were uh, what we just showed would have would have been running uh, on a PDP-11. So would you say that they would probably be using as input the Atelotype machine? More than likely at that time, they would have been typing uh, commands using a teletype. Uh, it wouldn't have been very long after that that you would have gotten a, uh, a video terminal until you've actually been typing thing, typing commands on a video terminal. But yeah, about 50 years ago, we're talking about 1973. Yeah, we are actually talking about uh, using a teletype. It's just easier to kind of do the demo here for running it on a, uh, on, a on a video screen. It's about 80 columns wide and, and 24 lines tall. All right. Um, so this question is, where would Unix be today if IBM accepted Bill Gates' offer to use Xenix as the OS of choice for the IBM PC and monopolize the market? I've thought about that question as well. And so the, the, the real issue there is that, you know, uh, you know I, I develop, I work on the FreeDOS operating system, right? So that's a, an open source version of uh, the old MS implementation of the old MS DOS operating system, just anything that was DOS, uh, and and DOS is as as people like to say, and actually I'll even say it too, it's barely an operating system, right? It's 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 really just there to kind of run the disk. Uh, it uh, it leaves a lot of the uh, the functions that are typically done by an operating system to the BIOS. That's really because it derived from uh, sort of a quick and dirty implementation of an operating system, literally called QDOS. Uh, there wasn't at the time because they were so fast at trying to get DOS to kind of hit the market with the original PC, kind of cut those corners. Uh, and it would been really interesting, I think really interesting to have a proper operating system early on in, uh, in, in the uh, development of the IBM PC that actually did operate more like Unix or having even a Unix system uh, that actually would manage this, the memory on the system, uh, would uh, would interact on, on the application's behalf with the hardware. Uh, that allows you to get around, you know, without that, without an operating system kind of managing all the memory for you, uh, applications on DOS actually have to do a lot of their own memory management. They're actually accessing the hardware directly. That's kind of why you get stuck with the 640K limit. Uh, there's other reasons in there too, but that's you're kind of stuck with uh, kind of that design that was sort of really quickly implemented. Uh, if you had an operating system like Unix, so if they, back to that question, if they'd taken the offer to kind of put a Unix system uh, or somehow put a Unix system on, uh, on the original IBM PC, if you'd done it early enough in the cycle, uh, you actually, uh, could have transformed uh, computing pretty quickly. Uh, would we still be running command line today, though, is probably the question sitting behind that. I don't think we would. I mean, at some point, uh, you know, everyone had to realize, you know, and, and, and Bill Gates has even said this as well in interviews, that at some point we, they, they realized, is the future of computing going to be in character mode where we're typing commands all the time and things are, are limited to uh, the characters you can display in sort of plain text mode? 
uh, even if it's got color and things like that? Or is the future going to be graphical mode where you can actually display things on screen exactly as it's going to be dis uh, be printed out on, on page, for example, uh, if you're talking about, say, a word processor. And yeah, so at some point, uh, I think we still would have gone to uh, some sort of a graphical interface. Uh, but I think the landscape would have looked different. Uh, you know, I, I, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be Windows, it'd be something else, but there would be definitely some kind of a GUI that would have shown up at some point. Yeah, I think that if I recall correctly, Commodore Amiga was going to be based on Unix, uh, but then something happened where they had to go with something else and they had to rush it in. It was not as good as it could have been. So I, 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 you often wonder if some, you know, similar story if, if they had started with mm -hmm. Unix. Yeah, it, I think that that uh, it's kind of interesting because you probably uh, it, it probably was a licensing issue, but yeah, it would been it would been. Definitely, it, the landscape would be different if we uh, were running on Unix today. Uh, this other question I think you already answered. Is this the PDP-11 error? I think you answered that already because you yep. said different version. We're running in the PDP-11, uh, uh, basically, for emulating the PDP-11 in these, in these kind of commands. Uh, so now the rest I have is comments. I joined Bell Labs in the early 80s and did my word processing this way. I still do. GROF is part of modern Linux distributions. Mm -hmm. And I love GROF. I, I started, uh, I didn't get to talk about my history, but I'll briefly mention here that I, uh, when I went to university in uh, the early 1990s, I, I, uh, that's when I discovered Unix. I did mention that, but uh, I, uh, I, I put Linux on my computer at home. And you know, I, I was dual booting into DOS, uh, which is obviously how I eventually came to do free DOS. But, uh, you know, I, there wasn't a word processor on Unix in 1993, which is when I installed it. Uh, and so I, if I wanted to not dual boot back into DOS and just stay in Linux for a little while longer, uh, I still had to write class papers because I was a university student. And so I, I realized I really should be learning how to write documents uh, on Linux, the, sort of the Unix way. And so I, I learned how to use NROF. And you could also use, you know, GROF had been released a couple years earlier. And so I, I could actually have used GROF to print nice looking output. But there was a really cool uh, sort of loophole that I found, which is that if you printed to our laser printer that we had in the campus computer lab, that cost money per, per page, that cost money. But it didn't cost money to print to the dot matrix printer. We had two dot matrix printer. We had a we had a line printer, but we also had a, a regular like you know eight and a half by eleven dot matrix printer, which nobody used because it was slower. Uh, but it was free, and so I learned that you could write documents uh, on on uh, GROF at home using NROF mode. Uh, and so I learned how to use the ME macros because uh, that was the best for me to write uh, to write papers. And uh, I could print them out at home on my dot matrix printer. I had an FX eighty, or I could wait. I could upload it to my uh, uh, to my uh, account on the Unix system and then print it out on campus if I was willing to do that. Kind of an early sort of quote unquote cloud computing, right? Because no matter where you were, as long as you had a terminal, and we had a number of VT220s spread throughout campus, as long as you had access to a terminal, you could hop on and you could uh, start working on your paper again. Uh, so it was kind of a cool thing. And, and so I still do use GROF today because I, in an odd way, I find GROF kind of fun. Uh, and so I like to write. Uh, I like to write doc documents using uh, GROF, and I'm I'm right now learning how to use the uh, the MOM macros from Peter Shafter. All right, thank you for that. Uh, the next comment is: Is it still worth? It's still worthwhile to generate documents this way because you can write a program to generate typeset documents. C program TROF to PS to PDF. I would agree. There's there's a certain value to that. I teach a class uh, at the beginning in the intro. We talked about how I uh, I teach a class on on technical writing and another one on on history of technology. And uh, in the in the technical writing, I teach a class called Writing with Digital Technologies uh, because we still write with digital technologies today. We can actually write HTML. It's kind of the standard way to write stuff today. It's most common, I should say. Uh, you can write things in other types of markup systems. XML can be a markup system. Uh, and you actually find LaTeX, for example, still used quite commonly in engineering and mathematics and sciences. 
and, but you also can can write documents just fine using uh, using GROF. And uh, as as that person says, yeah, you can uh, generate output for a postscript, uh, or you can convert that to a PDF, and uh, and then distribute the uh, the PDF. And it's uh, it, it, it's uh, if you once you kind of learn how to do the macros and the macro package that you're using, uh, it's it's not that hard. And I would encourage anybody to kind of give it a shot. All right. Um, someone said this is bringing back memories of doing reports in college. I use NROF then TROF. Yep, absolutely. Uh, another comment. I seem to remember that in Ed, when pressing backspace, it prints printed backslashes, but that could have been the terminal. Uh, that is true. Depending on the terminal that you're on, uh, if your terminal didn't support, if you're especially if we're running on a on a piece of paper, right, a teletype, uh, what does backspace mean, <laughs> right? I mean, on a, when you're printing on a piece of paper, there's it doesn't rub out the previous character uh, when it backs up, and so depending on your terminal, you uh, backspace would actually uh, like I had this on some early terminals that didn't understand video. Uh, it would print a, uh, I, I think the person is right, it would print a, a backslash character. And then as you continued hitting backspace, it would print the letters it was backspacing over in reverse order, right? So it basically was printing it in reverse order after the backslash. And then you could start typing again. And so it would allow you to kind of keep in mind where you are uh, and start typing again. And yeah, it, it, it was kind of like that, but it does depend on what terminal you're on. If you're, you know, here I was kind of emulating a, a video terminal because I said that the VT52 uh, was available a little bit after uh, the 50 years ago Unix, but there were other video terminals that were available at the time. And so just here I was emulating a video terminal, but it would have been really interesting, I think more challenging to uh, try and emulate a paper-based terminal the entire time uh, where you wouldn't have had that, that, uh, that backspace capability. Right, I did get another question. So what OS do you use today on a daily basis? Uh, my daily driver is uh, Fedora Linux. And so right now I'm running Fedora 38. Uh, but because I'm still involved in the FreeDOS project, I'm the person who created it back in 1994 and we're still going uh, and, and working on FreeDOS. I do run FreeDOS uh, and I, I don't boot it on hardware. I boot it within a... Uh, a virtual machine, and so I would say that my my two operating systems I run today are uh, are a modern Linux distribution. I'm running GNOME as my desktop, uh, and uh, I'm running. Uh, sometimes I'm I'm putting back into DOS in a little window so I can do DOS stuff. All right. Um, looks like that is all the questions we have and all the comments. Um, I really appreciate you coming and doing this talk. Uh, this is really great and fun. Um, I did myself once um, on a um, an AT and T um, machine. I forget the name, name of it off the top of my head. It was in the museum. So um, AT and T machine. So it had like the only the only editor was Ed. And so I was like, oh, this is like very <laughs> primitive. Um, there's no VI. Uh, in here, which I was used to when I was in college from 91 to 96. And I was like, all right, I have to look this up, how to do Ed, because I just wanted to just simply write Hello World in a mm -hmm. C program and show people how to use it. So I was like, oh, this is Ed. And it's like, because I know that, you know, long ago there was these very primitive one line editors. Uh, so I did get it to work and write the C program. And, and I was like, oh, what kind of compiler is is there? uh okay cc and it was like it was so it was like i had to like figure it out but i was like yeah this is, this is very very primitive um uh but uh yeah so it's interesting to see that how it was at the very beginning how how yeah. it was uh but anyway case we appreciate your talk um it was very interesting uh hopefully you can do further talks here on the channel and uh and that's it Sounds great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. All right. So I ended the stream.